I want to go over eight steps that if you follow these eight steps, you will find your right work at the end of the rainbow. However, these eight steps take a lot of discipline, so you've got to be ready. Okay? The first step, which was part of my first book, which was Perfect Vocational Day, which I trademarked in 2001 because I thought this was very important, is to envision what a perfect vocational day would be for the rest of your life. In other words, think, think now for a moment. And sometimes it's helpful to, to ask yourself, look, if I had all the money in the world, how would I live the rest of my life as designated by one day? In other words, when would you get up in the morning? What time? You might say, well, 8 o'clock. So you take a piece of paper and you write 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, you know, et cetera. Go, go through the whole day. And actually, like an artist who's designing, a, you know, designing, drawing, a painting, how would you design your perfect day for the rest of your life? When would you get up? Where would you go? Who would you be with? What would you do? Focused around your work. It has to focus around your work. You can't say, well, from 1 to 4, I'll just work. And in the morning, I'll go to Pete's and I'll do... No, it, ha it has to be focused around your work. Yeah, men always want to get up in the morning and go to Pete's and read the paper. And women want to work out. That's what I've found. Men eventually work out by the end of the day, I think, is based on my research. So your perfect vocational day, what would it be like, right? And this needs to be a day that you could just live over and over for the rest of your life, that you're so excited, you know, you're just drooling. So that's step one, by the way, of the eight steps, is to envision. You know this, but I'm going to repeat it. If you could envision what your life would be like if you just live this vision of your perfect vocational day, you could actually start to move towards it. Uh, versus if you can't get in your mind what it would look like, feel like, smell like, touch, touch, you know, sound like, it, it's hard to move towards this. You need the vision for your own life. No one's going to give you that. So the, the first step is vision, your vision of your perfect vocational day. So you have a vision. Wow, if I could just live this kind of life. Step two, write it down. You know, when you write an idea on paper, magic happens. First of all, you externalize the idea. It looks more important. Do you ever write your goals in January? My wife and I do this. We write our goals in January, and although we should, we don't really look at it until the following December. <laughs> but amazingly, about, we usually hit 60 to 70 percent. And, and I've been thinking about this lately. That's amazing how that works. Well, I know why it works intellectually. That's the way the mind works, you know. If you think a thought, you start to move towards it. But better to focus on what you want, by the way, versus, you know, what you don't want. A lot of us focus on what we don't want. Well, that was a terrible job. I don't want a job like that. I don't want a job like that. I don't want a job like that. And then you end up going into the same exact job. Focus on what you want. Step two, write it down. That's why goals are so important. Now, one, one idea about writing things down, I, I like this idea of writing your own biography. Resumes are passe. I mean, they're important, but they're not, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. Write your biography. So say your name is Mary Smith. If you're over 40, your biography should be about two to three years in the future. So first you think about, what, what do I want my life to be like, this perfect vocational day, two to three years from now? So you start to write. Mary Smith is, and you describe where you're living and what you're doing and who you're with. Maybe you're with new people. Maybe you're you know, in a different area of the country, whatever. You're not through with this biography until you're just drooling. Wow, if I could really live this life. So you write a future biography. Then you come back and you write today's biography. Well, today, Mary Smith is. And then you see the gap, you see. See, without a gap in your life, there's no problem. Hence, there's no movement. So one of the powerful uh, ideas I have is to write down what you vision so you can start to see it. Step three, talk to everybody you see strangers, family, more strangers, about what it is that you really want to do. The more you tell people what you want to do in terms of your work, the more you start to move towards it, right? The more you start to believe it. But I don't know, 15 years ago, I was an IT manager in corporate America, but I wanted to become a psychologist. You know, I just started my PhD program. And I was on a plane coming back from a business trip, and this woman got on the plane, and she just started talking to me, and I put my laptop aside, and she told me her whole life's history and all of her problems. And because I was an aspiring psychologist, you know, I helped her for like a five-hour therapy session. And at the end, she was, she was so happy. I mean, I guess I gave her some good ideas. And she said, by the way, what, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a psychologist. 
Thank you, Dr. Nathanson. And, you know, I was just an IT manager at the time, but, <laughs> but I was good at this. I was good at this. And I thought to myself later, well, I could do this. I could do this. Talk to everybody you can about what it is that you want to do. Right? That's step three. So envision, write it down, talk about it. Step four, you're not going to like this. You're going to want your money back from the Commonwealth Club after step four. <laughs> you have to make big change in your life. You know this. If you want to recreate a second half of life around your work that's full of passion and fulfillment and joy, you have to be able and willing to make big change. And that big change is different for each person. It might be a lifestyle change. It might be a location change. You might have to move to a less expensive area. You might have to get a new relationship and get rid of the old one. Or you might have to start a new one. You might have to change the way you handle your money. By the way, when you do what you love, you respect every dollar you earn, by the way. When you don't do what you love, the money just comes in and it, it goes out. I don't know if you ever noticed that. That's why this concept, this idea I have about what could you sell for one dollar? Because you sell something for a dollar and you get so excited, right? You appreciate it and you want to start to make your money that way. So, so envision. Write it down. Talk to others. Make big change. What big change are you going to have to make in your life to sort of move these barriers aside? The, the next step is to really get support. The problem is most of us end up in wrong work because the more people we hang around, they're also doing work that isn't, isn't what we want to do. If you're a teacher, you've got to hang around teachers. You can't hang around engineers. If you're a therapist, you don't want to hang around construction workers. You hang around people that you really want to, you know, that you want to be doing that work. So here's some ideas for, for building a support system for yourself around your work. It's really three tiers. The first tier, get about six people in your life who are just interested in what you're interested in. Ever notice when you're around people who share the same interests as you, you kind of feel better about yourself? You don't feel like something's broken? You're like, wow, you like that, I like that too. Now, these people really don't help you much other than to make you feel whole. So think about what you're really passionate about tonight, where you want to start to reorientate your work towards, and think about how you could find half a dozen people to connect with on a weekly, biweekly basis that are just interested in your circle. Then next, find about three people who are interested but supportive. In other words, they give you ideas. Think about where can you find two or three people that will, that will not only be interested, but they'll give you ideas. Tonight would be a good example of tier two. You're all here, I, I assume, because you're interested in this topic of right work for yourself, not um, economics. And I bet among each other, there's lots of ideas to share. And maybe you'll walk away from me with some ideas tonight. So this is a good example of, of tier two. And tier three is find a coach, find a mentor, living or dead. You know, my mentor for years was Benjamin Franklin. And he never knew me, and I never got to talk to him, but I read all his books. And I love it. He used to go to bed at night with an index card. It was kind of like an index card. And he would pull it out, and he would read his virtues just before he went to sleep. Was I creative? Yeah. Was I uh, frugal? Yeah. Was I friendly? Yeah. Uh, did I exercise? Uh, okay, tomorrow. <laughs> But, but I thought, what a, what a way to live your life is to, as, a, as a person of integrity, is to figure out your values and, and sort of look at them every single day. So find a coach. Find a mentor. Find somebody who, who really could cheer you on. And that's hard. The last time most of us had coaches was when, if we were lucky, we were in sports as kids. Usually we say, well, I have my spouse as my coach. R -r wrong. In some cases. Unless you're fortunate. Then you're they're in good shape. So, so support, right? That's the next step. After that, take small steps. It's important that you don't let a day go by without starting to take some steps toward right work. I have a client who, who was frustrated and upset that these young kids were coming back from Iraq and they had not seen their families for, year, for many, two years, one year, two years, and he wanted to do something. So he started a, a program called Warrior Vacations. And it, what he does is he helps uh, condominium owners, resort owners, uh, uh, give away free uh, rooms for vacations to the families of, of, the, of the military folks coming back. And that was his passion. It started out as just something he wanted to do, and now it's a full-time full -time occupation. He was a lawyer before. My, my, my point is, 
he started that by just making one phone call. I said, just make one phone call. Call somebody who owns a resort and see if they would give up a room for a summer for two weeks to somebody from Iraq. I mean, so he did it. It worked. And, and then one step led to another. So if you take small steps, don't let a night go by without doing one thing just before you go to sleep that relates to what you're, what's really important to you. Because, you know, life goes quick. Life goes really, really, really quick. I had a client many years ago. He was in his 70s. And... Uh, he wanted to make a transition. And I said, I want you to go out and buy a, a glass a bottle of marbles. And let's put the, the amount of marbles in the, in the jar should represent the amount of days you have left in your life. And we looked at the actuary tables. And, you know, he was supposed to live to 86. So he had like 16 years times, I don't know, 20, 30,000 marbles. And a couple years later, he called me up and said, I finally understand what this was about. I woke up in the morning and I noticed that the, 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 the marbles were finally going down. And I realized how fast life goes. And he made his transition. So it's important to make progress every day to do something. You know, don't wait. Must versus should. That's the two words to remember. The eighth step, sorry, seventh step, is to measure your progress. No one's going to measure after tonight's session whether you're moving towards right work for you, right? You have to measure that. I would say all of you are going to get up tomorrow and you're either going to go back to this job or you're going to go back to looking for one. And no one's going to measure anywhere up there next to you whether uh, you're focusing on the right work or not. That has to come from you. So coming up with a system just to measure your progress. Uh, you know, you've heard the adage, if, if you measure it, it gets done. And last, the eighth step is really to celebrate. I mean, just celebrate that you came tonight to get some ideas. The Commonwealth Club does great marketing for these events. And I bet there's at least five times as many people that said, you know, wow, how to find right work. What a great topic. I'm going to come to this. And they're not here. But you decided and you came. So there's a difference between deciding and taking action, you see. So celebrate. Celebrate that you came tonight. Celebrate you came with, to, to get some ideas and you left this room committed to, to recreate a second half of life for you that's going to give you more passion, more fulfillment around, around the work that's right for you. If you forget everything I've said tonight, it's important for you to define what this concept of right work means. That's why I wrote a book about it. I think it's so important.